means it's time to start. Uh, good to see everybody tonight. Let's open our Bibles. 2 Samuel 16. And we left off at verse 15. And of course, remember, we left off in verse 15, not on Sunday night. You may be thinking, we skipped the first 15 verses. Well, remember, we covered those on Saturday night and Sunday morning. So if you, if you missed that, you can, can go online to, to, to catch up. We're picking up now in verse 15. David, once again, has become a, a man on the run. As you remember, he and his family had to escape from Jerusalem, head out to the wilderness to get away from his own son, Absalom who'd stolen the, the, the throne of Israel and was looking to put his own father to death. Again, it's, you just let that settle in. Right? It's, it's not that his son just, you know, took the car, you know, for the weekend without telling dad. Right? He's trying to kill his own father. That's the place that, that David is in. And to add further insult to injuries, David, you remember, made his way out of the, of the city. He found himself essentially being treated like a punching bag by this guy by the name of Shimei, a family member of Saul, who was using David's difficulty as an opportunity to heap curses on him, throw rocks at him as he was escaping. But at this point in the chapter, now the scene really shifts. It moves now from David fleeing from Jerusalem to Absalom arriving to Jerusalem. And what we find now is in the midst of this incredible mistreatment that David is experiencing, even though the Lord was using it, as we know, to grow David, to, to sanctify David, what we find is that God was still working behind the scenes. Even though it seemed like everything was caving in, it seemed like everything was over, yet we see our God still working in a miraculous way to thwart the evil plans of Absalom in order to have the Lord's will done, which was to put David back on the throne. We're going to be reminded of that tonight, just God's sovereignty even in the midst of the worst evil. And by the way, if you like a good spy story, you're really going to enjoy what's before us tonight. So let's pray, and we'll jump in. Father, we thank you again for this time, God, and we just thank you again for that time of worship and just that reminder, Lord, that this is not all there is. Lord, we get, we get caught up in this world, and we forget so easily. Lord, what awaits us, God, beyond this realm? We thank you for the hope that we have in you, Jesus, no matter how bad it gets here, Lord. This is not the end. And Lord, even in the midst of difficulty, even as we wait for that end, we thank you for how you sustain us in the here and now. And Lord, as we see how you sustain David, how you were working on his behalf in the midst of great evil and wickedness, Lord, remind us that you're the same sovereign God over our circumstances today. And so be our teacher now, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Verse 15, 2 Samuel 16. Meanwhile, Absalom and all the people, the men of Israel, came to Jerusalem and Ahithophel was with him. So as I said, David's now gotten out of town. Absalom now arrives in Jerusalem after being declared king in, in Hebron. And we're told specifically he wasn't alone. This man Ahithophel, remember this close counselor, this close confidant of, of David's who had defected to Absalom's side is now arriving here with Absalom. And that's significant as we're going to see in a moment the impact that he has in Absalom's life. And as we see what Ahithophel is going to lead Absalom in, I think it's important to remember, even now, that Ahithophel had special motivation, if you will, to stand with Absalom and to really see David done in. And remember that motivation we talked about is that Ahithophel was Bathsheba's grandfather. So there seems to be some bitterness that he had held in his heart for David's adultery with his granddaughter and then the murder of her husband. It's important to remember that because we're really going to see where that bitterness is going to lead. Verse 16, And so it was, when Hushai the archite, David's friend, came to Absalom, that Hushai said to Absalom, Long live the king, long live the king. So Absalom said to Hushai, Is this your loyalty to your friend? Why did you not go with your friend? And Hushai said to Absalom, No, but whom the Lord and this people and all the men of Israel choose, his I will be, and with him I will remain. Furthermore, whom should I serve? Should I not serve in the presence of his son? As I have served in your father's presence, so will I be in your presence. Now, you remember this guy, Hushai? He, he was the guy, seems to be an older Older gentleman who came to David. David's escaping Jerusalem. He hit the Mount of Olives. And remember, this, this guy shows up with his robe torn, with dust on his head. 
he comes in this state of grieving, mourning over what had happened to, to David, definitely on David's side. And he comes wanting to go with David, support David. Remember, David says, no, no, really, you're going to be more of a burden if you go with us, trying, trying to keep up. But what would be a blessing is if you would go back to Jerusalem and if you would go and present yourself to Absalom and place yourself as a spy in his court. Go back. Pledge yourself to, to Absalom as king so you can hear, you can, you can see what's happening, and then you can get word to me so we can thwart the counsel of Ahithophel. So Husha agreed to this plan. He became a secret agent for David. Remember, David had prayed, Lord, when he found out Ahithophel had defected to Absalom, he said, Lord, turn the counsel of Ahithophel into foolishness. And the very next thing that we read in the scripture was that Hushai showed up. He was the answer to that prayer. And we'll see how God uses him here. But now when he, when he arrives back to Absalom, initially we see that, that Absalom is taken aback. What are you doing here? Why aren't you sticking with your friend David? Where's your loyalty to him? He begins to question him. And Hushai says, no, no, I'm standing with the one the Lord and the people have chosen to be king. So Hushai, he, he lies to Absalom that, that he's on his side. He conceals his identity as a, as a good spy. Now, was it right or wrong for him to do this? I'll let you argue that. Right or wrong, what we do know, though, is that the Lord uses it. Again, I'm not saying God condoned it, but he does use it. Now, now some will even point out, some commentators will say, well, well, he didn't technically lie. He didn't technically say he was on Absalom's side. They say verse 18 could be a reference to David. They could just say, I'm standing with the one the Lord has chosen, meaning I know God's really chosen David. I know the people really chose David. And then some say, verse 19, he just basically says, I will serve in your presence. He doesn't say I'll serve for good. He just says I'll serve. Now, again, it's clear what he's insinuating, but again, that's what some propose but either way, Absalom, no doubt, I believe, blinded by his prize. We've seen that's a huge issue for him. He quickly believes, well, well of course, right? I mean, Ahithophel transferred allegiance, so why wouldn't Hushai want to be around a great guy like me? And so he accepts him into his court. He allows him to remain. And David has his plant now in Jerusalem. Verse 20, then Absalom said to Ahithophel, give advice as to what we should do. And Ahithophel said to Absalom, go into your father's concubines, whom he has left to keep the house, and all Israel will hear that you are abhorred by your father. Then the hands of all who are with you will be strong. So they pitched a tent for Absalom on the top of the house, and Absalom went into his father's concubines in the sight of all Israel. So again, Absalom arrives in Jerusalem. David's already gone. He's missed him. So he turns to Ahithophel. Okay, what's our next move? Well, what do we do now to solidify the throne, to solidify my rule? And what a move. What counsel Ahithophel gives him. Go in and take your father's concubines. Now, we know from history, this is something that kings would, would often do when they took over a kingdom to utterly humiliate the old king. And also, as Ahithophel says, this would eliminate any possibility of reconciliation with David. If any of those following Absalom had in the back of their mind, we're following him, we're, we're joining this rebellion, what if, what if Absalom decides, you know what, I kind of like my dad. You know, I'm done with this. I'm just going to go and join back with dad. Right? And then we're done for. Right? Now, now, now we're going to be put to death because we joined in this thing and we're not his kid. Ahithophel said, that will let your men know there's no way you will ever reconcile with your dad. This will show how serious you are about kicking him to the curb. And they will be strengthened to follow you. Now, I imagine when David left those ten concubines back in, in Jerusalem to, to kind of take care of things, I, I imagine he never dreamed this would be done to these ladies. And yet, here is this plan that comes out of this one-time confidant and counselor and friend of Ahithophel's mouth. And I believe what it seems to show us 
It's just how much that bitterness had affected Ahithophel's heart. That bitterness that he had held on to over what David did to, to his family has now taken such a deep root in this man. He's counseling Absalom to do 10 times worse than what David did to his own granddaughter. He calls Absalom to commit adultery and ultimately rape that's 10 times worse than David ever committed with Bathsheba. I mean, you think about that, that concern that he no doubt had for his granddaughter doesn't seem to translate to any concern for these 10 ladies who were someone else's granddaughter. I think it really just shows us something that the Bible teaches us over and over again. One more example over here shows us what allowing a root of bitterness to reside in our hearts will do to us. That bitterness that we allow to, to settle in our lives will take us to places and lead us to act in ways that we may have never imagined we could ever go. And I think in those moments when we've been hurt so deeply, it's so important, especially in those moments, to remind ourselves God knows how to bring justice on our behalf. God knows how to take up our defense. It's to remember what God says about himself when he tells us that vengeance belongs to him. He knows how to deal with those who've done us wrong. And when we hold on to that anger and we try and take matters into our own hands, it becomes very dangerous for our own lives. Now, would this plan hurt David? Absolutely, it will hurt David. But the path Ahithophel has allowed himself to go down, as we ultimately will see, is going to destroy his own life. Now, remember, Nathan, when, when David committed that sin with Bathsheba and Nathan confronted him, remember one of the things Nathan prophesied is that this very thing would take place. Remember, he told David, what you have done in private is going to be done publicly for all Israel to see. In fact, some say this may have been the very rooftop that, that David was on when he saw Bathsheba. But the fact that it was prophesied, remember, didn't take away from Absalom and Ahithophel's guilt in all of it. Now, Ahithophel's advice is not going to stop for Absalom. He's got more to offer but first, notice what we're told about Ahithophel. Verse 23. Now, the advice of Ahithophel, which he gave in those days, was as if one had inquired at the oracle of God. So was all the advice of Ahithophel, both with David and with Absalom. We have this kind of parenthetical note here that the, the Holy Spirit has the writer give us concerning Ahithophel. I want us to understand, this is not just some random guy. I mean, this was the guy who everyone listened to. He had the highest reputation when it came to giving good counsel. And, and even now, even though Absalom isn't giving godly counsel, from a worldly perspective, it was good counsel. This was the way to show the, the people you're making a clear break from your father. And if they follow you, they don't have to worry about you reconciling with dad. And they're hung out to dry and put to death because they were part of a rebellion. This was good worldly advice. And he's going to give more right counsel in, in just a moment, even though, again, it's in an ungodly sense. But what this statement is showing us is that in a minute we're going to see that Absalom rejects Ahithophel's advice. And from a worldly perspective, that makes zero sense, considering who this guy was, that what he said was the right move. Man, it's always been the godly move, but it was the right move. And what this is going to show us is that in the midst of this great evil that was transpiring and everything seeming to go the wrong direction, everything falling apart around David, no chance. He's got a Hithophel. Absalom got a Hithophel at his side. He's going to make every right move. I'm done for. As we're going to see, what this shows us is that God was still on the throne and he was still in charge even in the midst of this great evil. Verse 1, chapter 17. Moreover, Ahithophel said to Absalom, Now let me choose 12,000 men, and I will arise and pursue David tonight. And notice Ahithophel's heart to take out David. Again, he's a counselor, but right now he's ready to be a warrior. Why? Because he has the opportunity to take down David. So he says, Let me get an army. We're going to go and we're going to hit him tonight. He says in verse 2, I will come upon him while he was weary and weak and make him afraid. And all the people who are with him will flee, and I will strike only the king. 
Then I will bring back all the people to you. And when all return except the man whom you seek, all the people will be at peace. And the saying, verse 4 says, pleased Absalom and all the elders of Israel. Again, from a worldly strategy, this was an excellent plan. He said, I'm going to go and I'm going to strike David immediately. Now, you notice there's a lot of eyes in this. I will come upon him. I will strike him. I will bring him back. And he, he wants to do David in. But it's good wisdom. David, as we know, is on the run. David's weary. David's an emotional train wreck at this point. He doesn't have his bearings about him. We read of the emotional distress he's under. This was the right time to strike. And not only was the advice to strike immediately, but we notice it was to strike surgically. I'm going to go in now, and I'm only going to kill David, Absalom. I'm going to spare the rest of the people. And so when I bring them back, they're going to see we preserved their life. We protected them, so they're going to be at peace with us. They're going to be on our side. They will follow you. This was good advice. David was in no place to battle. And in the moment, we see Absalom and the leadership, they were all for this plan. They recognized this is the right thing to do. But again, what's interesting is what comes next. Even though they've got the best counselor at their side, right? okay, you're the best, you told us this, we're going to do this, yet for some reason, Absalom decides to get one more opinion. Verse 5, then Absalom said, now call Hushai, the archive, also, and let us hear what he says too. And when Hushai came to Absalom, Absalom spoke to him, saying, Ahithophel has spoken in this manner. Shall we do as he says? If not, speak up. And so he calls in Hushai. He begins to lay out the plan. You know, Ahithophel says we need to hit David now. He's a wreck. We'll catch him off guard. We'll preserve the people. They'll be on our side. What do you think? Now, as this is going through Hushai's ears, he obviously would have realized this is a good plan. He knows David. He's seen David. He knows this will work. David's done for. He knew how vulnerable David was. So he has to think very quickly on his feet right, to give an alternative. And this is what comes forth. So Hushai said to Absalom, The advice that Ahithophel has given is not good at this time. For, said Hushai, you, you know your father and his men, that they are mighty men, and they are enraged in their minds like a bear robbed of her cubs in the field. And your father is a man of war and will not camp with the people. Surely by now he is hidden in some pit or in some other place, and it will be when some of them are overthrown at the first that whoever hears it will say there is slaughter among the people who follow Absalom, and even he who is valiant, whose heart is like the heart of a lion, will melt completely." All Israel knows that your father is a mighty man, and those who are with him are valiant men. Now again, the truth was, David at this moment was a mess. But you see what Hushai does. Hushai, in Absalom's mind, begins to paint the picture, not of the, the present David, but the old David. The warrior David. The David that that Absalom grew up seeing in, in the house. He seeks to, to get Absalom to remember that guy. So he says, oh, you know your dad. You know what a mighty man he is. You know what a, what a warrior he is. You know the men he has around him. I mean, right now, they're, they're like a mama bear whose, whose cubs have been taken from her, which means that that's, that's not somebody you want to mess with. It's what people that go up to Cade's Cove need to realize, right? <laughs> up there trying to pet this little bear cub, not realizing mom is in the woods watching all this. Right, you, you, you poke the bear, Absalom. You don't want to mess with him in this position. He's on edge. He's probably already hidden away. He's probably already strategizing how to get the upper hand. You're going to walk right into his trap. And when he strikes, the people are going to hear this. And then they're going to begin to freak out and think, oh no, Absalom's losing. He's done for. They're going to start doubting if they should stick with you. So he, he lays out this this vision, this idea, which was true of David at one point in his life, but not at this point. And in light of that, he now offers an alternative plan. Verse 11, he says, Therefore, I advise that all Israel be fully gathered to you, from Dan to Beersheba, that is, from the north to the south, like the sand that is by the sea for multitude, and that you go to battle in person. Notice that. We'll come back in a moment. 
So we will come upon him in some place where he may be found, and we will fall on him as the dew falls on the ground. And of him and all the men who are with him, there shall not be left so much as one. And moreover, if he is withdrawn into a city, no big deal, then all Israel shall bring ropes to that city, and we will pull it into the river until there is not one small stone found there. And so instead of this quick, immediate strike, Husha says, here's what we need to do. You know your dad's ready. We need, we need to take our time. And Absalom, you need to gather up an even greater army. Forget, forget 12,000. Right? We, we need thousands upon thousands. So when we go after David, we just completely overwhelm him. Like, 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 the, like the sea on the, on the seashore. Or like the sand on the seashore. Just sheer numbers overpowering him. You'll be able to crush him at that point. And if he tries to hide away in a city, we'll have the manpower to just obliterate that entire city and David will be annihilated. Now, of course, Hushai is saying all this simply to buy more time for David. It would take time to gather a bigger army. And so he's trying to stall Absalom. The longer David gets, the more prepared he will actually be. And and within this, as, as we noted Back at the end of verse 11, you notice Hushai calls upon Absalom to lead this attack. He says, and you go to battle in person. Don't don't send Ahimelech. Don't let him go for you. No, you go. And you show yourself a mighty warrior. You show yourself as a a chip off the old block. That your dad David has nothing on you when it comes to, to military power. Of course, which seems to be an attempt to play on Absalom's pride. Again, Hushai knows this is a weak part of this man's life. And as the Bible tells us, of course, pride, I'll get it right in a minute. Pride goes before a fall. And that's exactly what awaits Absalom. But again, knowing the facts. If you weighed these two plans together, Ahithophel's was the correct counsel in order to take David out. This was the right time to strike. It was obvious, it was clear. But it's not the decision that Absalom makes. Verse 14. So Absalom and all the men of Israel said, the advice of Hushai the archite is better than the advice of Ahithophel. And here's why he said this. For the Lord had purposed to defeat the good advice of Ahithophel to the intent that the Lord might bring disaster on Absalom. The reason was not because it was better advice. The reason was because the Lord had purposed. Reminds us of Proverbs 21, verse 1, that says, The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. Like the rivers of water, he turns it wherever he wishes. As Absalom is seeking to carry out this evil plan, and he has everything on his side, all the resources, he's got the best counselors. He's got all the momentum, yet we see the hand of the Lord superseding all of it and shifting his heart to do exactly what the Lord had intended. And it looked like David was done for. He's a sitting duck. Darkness has won. But the Lord was working behind the scenes to turn Absalom's heart to receive what was really bad advice in order to stop this rebellion from Absalom. And I think what an important truth to to have our hearts reminded of tonight. As we look at the evil that is in motion by governmental leaders today in our world, in our nation, and and the wicked plans that they seek to, to, to carry out. And you can look at these things and you see the momentum of these things. And you easily just feel like things are so out of control. I mean, darkness has just consumed everything. There's no hope. When, as we're reminded here in 2 Samuel 17, the fact is our God's still on the throne. He still has charge over the worst administrations. And I think we especially need that reminder here at election time. Now, we need to vote, and we need to to seek to elect the most righteous candidate. We can't elect a fully righteous candidate because Jesus isn't running. So our, our next best is to seek to elect the most righteous. Why? Because the Scripture tells us righteousness exalts a nation. But sin is a reproach. It's a disgrace to to any people. So we we seek to to elect and and focus on the most righteous. But the fact is, no matter how things turn out, 
And no matter how much those who have evil intentions like an Absalom are in power, we're reminded here the Lord's purposes still reign. And no matter what human may be on the throne, as Daniel declared, it's the Most High that still rules in the kingdoms of men. And we have a great example of that here with David and with Absalom. Verse 15, Then Hushai said to Zadok and Abiathar the priest, Thus and so Ahithophel advised Absalom and the elders of Israel, and thus and so I have advised. Now remember what's going on here. Remember Zadok and Abiathar, the, these priests. These were the guys, they, they had come to David in the beginning too when he was first fleeing from, from Jerusalem. Remember they came out carrying the ark and they were going to go with David and David said, no, take the ark back. I'm not going to trust in this, in this symbol. And by the way, as you take the ark back, why don't you guys stay in Jerusalem as well? And you can, you can seek the Lord to hear his voice. And then you can, based on what you hear, then you can get word to me, remember, through, through your sons. And so they had been sent back. And when, when Hushai had come to David, David reminded him, hey, Hushai, I'm sending you back. But remember, you're not alone. I've already got two guys there, two priests, and with their ears open, with their eyes open as well. And so Hushai now, in connection with these guys, he passes on the plan that Absalom had agreed to, but letting David know, here's, here's what Ahithophel is, is, is saying, wants to do, and they're now going to get the message out to David. Verse 16, Now therefore, send quickly and tell David, saying, Do not spend this night in the plains of the wilderness, but speedily cross over, lest the king and all the people who are with him be swallowed up. And when he says cross over, he, he's talking about crossing over the Jordan River. So he's saying, David, you need to run as fast as you can. Get away as fast as possible in case, in case Absalom changes his mind, in case this, you know, he's able to get an army that you know, happens quicker than we are expecting. Run as far away as you can. Use this delay to get more distance between you and him to protect yourself. Verse 17, Now Jonathan and Ahimaaz stayed at En Rogel, for they dared not be seen coming into the city. So a female servant would come and tell them, and they would go and tell King David. Now, Jonathan and Ahimaaz, these were the sons of Zadok and Abiathar the priest. These, these were, were the runners. And so again, you step back, you had quite the spy ring going on here, don't you? I mean, this is quite an intricate web. You got Hushai, he's in the inner circle. He hears what's happening. He relays things to Zadok and Abiathar, they send a female servant with the message to their, to their sons who are hiding away outside the city so they aren't detected. I mean, this is, this is quite the elaborate scheme going on here. But even with all this protection, we see these guys still get caught in a sense. Verse 18 says, Nevertheless, a lad saw them and told Absalom, but both of them went away quickly and came to a man's house in Berhurim who had a well in his court, and they went down into it. So even with all these precautions, right, these boys still get spotted. Right? They, they, they still get made, and word quickly gets back to, to Absalom. So these guys immediately, they take off. They begin running. They, they run across this house where they, where they find a man's well, and they jump in the well. And we're assuming it was a dry well. <laughs> Otherwise, they got wet. But, but, I mean, things are getting kind of intense now, aren't they? I mean, this is a good spy thriller. What's this family going to do? Who's, whose side are they going to be on? Verse 19, Then the woman took and spread a covering over the well's mouth and spread gra ground grain on it, and the thing was not known. And when Absalom's servants came to the woman at the house, they said, Where are Ahimaaz and Jonathan? So the woman said to them, They have gone over the water brook. And when they had searched and could not find them, they returned to Jerusalem. And so much like Rahab hiding the spies there in Jericho, this woman, no doubt along with her husband, hides these two guys. And so when Absalom's men show up looking for, for them, she, oh, they already left here. I'm, I'm just kind of doing, my, doing my, my work here. Don't mind me. Hiding these men in, in her well. I think it's interesting that in this protection, we see that, that even though so many in the nation had turned their allegiance over to Absalom, 
as we read, he, the hearts of the men were turned towards him. It's interesting to note, not everyone in the nation had. And of all the houses to stop in, of all the, the wells to jump into, it's to this man and this wife whose allegiance was still to David, again, that these men seek protection from. Again, we just see the sovereign hand of God even in the midst of this great wickedness, in the midst of this great evil. Verse 21, Now it came to pass after they had departed that they came up out of the well and went and told King David and said to David, Arise, cross over the water quickly, for thus has Ahithophel advised against you. So David and all the people who were with him arose and crossed over the Jordan. And by morning light, not one of them was left who had not gone over the Jordan. So again, the Lord protects these guys. So the message is they will get to David and they are able to get everyone across the Jordan River, across to safety, buying more time before Absalom is going to arrive. Verse 23. Now when Ahithophel saw, notice this, when Ahithophel saw that his advice was not followed, he saddled a donkey and arose and went home to his house, to his city. Then he put his household in order and hanged himself and died, and he was buried in his father's tomb. What a sad end to a life. A life that had been used so valuably. I mean, a life who had the privilege of being right beside King David, the greatest king in Israel's history, to have a seat right beside this man after God's own heart, to be able to speak into his ear, to be able to, to help him know the will of the Lord, to have that incredible privilege, and now to end up this way. Some people think that he killed himself because he felt disrespected, that Absalom would, would choose to follow Hushai over him, and, and maybe there was some of that, but, but I'll lean to the fact that it seems more likely that what's going on here is he recognized since Absalom chose Hushai's plan, it meant Absalom would fail. The rebellion would be crushed, and thus Ahithophel would be exposed as a, as a traitor, and so he just went ahead and ended his life knowing what the outcome was going to be. I mean, he knew this was a bad plan. He knew Absalom accepted the bad plan. And so I think in his mind, he's thinking, oh, it's clear. God's against us. We're not going to win. This is going south quickly. And filled with that despair, he, he choose, chose to take his own life rather than, than face what would come. And I look at him, and I think it's so sad that, that in seeing that God was obviously against him, that he didn't step back and say, well, what have I done? How foolish have I been? And God at least tried to, to confess his sin to the Lord and, and, and to David and seek the mercy of David. He knew how merciful David was. He knew the mercy that he'd, he'd shown to all of Saul's house. But instead of seeking that, that mercy, he thinks, what's the point? There's no hope. And, of course, that's what the enemy always wants to make us think, isn't it? You, you, you've gone too far. You, you've, you've just done too bad. For, forget it. There's no hope for you. There's no chance for you to, to, to confess and repent and receive grace. You might as well just end it. You might as well just forget it. You might as well just throw in the towel. Again, that's the mark of the enemy. He still wants to speak to our lives. Don't, don't let him lie to you like that. No sin is too far gone. There's no sin that God can't forgive. He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. God says, come, let's reason together. Though your, your sins are as scarlet, I'll wash them whiter than snow. Don't believe the lie that Ahithophel believed. And again, so tragic. On the one hand, he makes such a responsible move by, by going back and getting his household in order. And then he turns around and makes such an irresponsible move and taking his own life. It's tragic. Again, just reminds us, instead of allowing the Lord to deal with David over his sin, here was a man who sought to take matters into his own hands, and he's the one who ended up paying the greatest price. And again, it's how unforgiveness, it's how revenge always works. And of course, as we see this one-time companion of King David who walked closely with him, betraying him, then took his life, we can't help but think of the prophetic picture it is of Judas who had walked so closely with King Jesus and how his life ended after betraying the Lord as well. 
Verse 24. Then David went to Mahanaim, and Absalom crossed over the Jordan. So he's finally amassed an army. Here he comes. He and all the men of Israel with him. And Absalom made Amasa captain of the army instead of Joab. This Amasa was the son of a man whose name was Jithra, an Israelite, who had gone into Abigail, the daughter of Nahash, sister of Zariah, Joab's mother. There will be a test on that. So Israel and Absalom encamped in the land of Gilead. All that to, to say Amasa was David's nephew. And so Absalom makes David's nephew now the captain of his army. And this shows us here's another family member betraying David, turning his back on, on David, and now following Absalom. In verse 27, now it happened when David had come to Mahanaim that Shobai, the son of Nahash from Rabbah of the people of Ammon, Maker, the son of Emilio from Lodabar, and Barzillai, the Gileadite from Rogalim, brought beds and basins, earthen vessels and wheat, barley and flour, parched grain and beans, lentils and parched seeds, honey and curds, sheep and cheese of the herd for David and the people who were with him to eat. For they said, the people are hungry and weary and thirsty in the wilderness. This is interesting, such a contrast. Remember Ziba back in chapter 16? This, this servant of Saul who was currently the servant of Mephibosheth. He brought the goods for David. I'm here, I heard you're coming out, and I'm here to you know, bless you. Remember, he wasn't to bless him, right? It was to, to trick him, make him think Mephibosheth had rejected him so he could steal and take all that was Mephibosheth's. Whereas he came with improper motives, these three guys now show up with these possessions with pure motives. These guys truly wanted to bless David. They truly wanted to, to provide for, for him, to meet his needs. We read of these three guys, Shobai. We're told he was the son of, of Nahash. Remember, Nahash was the, the king that David tried to honor when Nahash's father had died. And remember, all the men around Nahash said, oh, he's not trying to honor you. He's just trying to slip in, you know, see our defenses so he can come attack us. So remember, they took David's men and shaved off half their beard and you know, cut their pants off at the waist right, and sent them home. That this is now his son honoring David, um, Maker, the son of Emilio. Remember, this is, this is the one who housed Mephibosheth before he came in, into David's household. And then Barzillai, this is the first time we've heard of him. We'll see of him later fighting with David. But, but these three men show up with pure motives to bless David. And again, what's interesting is that all three of these are Gentiles that sought to bless David. And we've seen that theme over and over. Yes, there were still Jews who, who stayed with David, but again, it's this prophetic picture. The majority of the Jews rejected King David for Absalom, just as the majority of the Jews would reject King Jesus. But who would believe? Who would the gospel go forth to, as we read this morning in Acts? The Gentiles. So here are these, these Gentiles now blessing the king, serving the king, even though he's being outcast, even though he's being pushed to the side and, and rejected by, by much of, of the nation. And again, there's this beautiful picture in this, though again in a very hard place, difficult circumstances. Oh, it's turning against David. What do we see? We see the faithfulness of the Lord to provide others who would stand with David, who would, who would come to his aid. Listen to these words from A.W. Pink. He says, there is a law of compensation which is conspicuously exemplified in the divine government of human affairs. A balance is strikingly preserved between losses and gains, bitter disappointments and pleasant surprises. If a heartless Pharaoh determines to slay the children of the Hebrews, his own daughter is constrained to care for Moses. If Elijah has to flee from Palestine to escape the fury of Ahab and Jezebel, a widow at Zarephath is willing to share her last meal with him. If the parents of Jesus Christ were poverty-stricken, wise men from the east come with a gift of gold, which made possible their flight and sojourn in Egypt. If a man's foes be those of his own household, friends are raised up for him in the most unexpected quarters. Let us not then dwell unduly upon the former, and let us not fail to be grateful and return thanks for the latter. 
as we think about our own lives, those who are closest to us, those who should have been standing with us, just like David. I mean, his own family turned against us. Maybe we've had our own family turn against us, whether it was parents, whether it was a spouse, whether it was kids, whoever it may have been, those who were not there for us when they should have been there. It's easy to get focused on those, isn't it? To get consumed with those. Instead of stepping back and recognizing the others God has brought in to be that support for us. Those unexpected friends, those unexpected acquaintances, those people God has, has brought in, those, those now people in the body of Christ, they're now our true family that God brings in to stand with us, to support us, to minister to us in our time of need. What a blessing. And that's exactly what David receives here. It's, it's what the Lord does for his kids. And you just have to wonder, did, did David have this event in mind? As he's there in this place, his enemy, Absalom, is, is, is pressing in. And yet, here are these who show up to, to spread this table for David. You just wonder, did, did David have this event in mind when he wrote in Psalm 23, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Here with Absalom bearing down on him, the faithfulness of the Lord to provide this table of food for David and his men in this moment. Again, that's our God. That's his goodness towards us. <clears throat> and that's what David experienced. And so tonight, as we, again, just glean from, from this chapter, what an encouragement I think it is, no matter what situation we're in tonight, the Lord knows how to, and he will provide for our lives. He's proven it. And no matter how wicked and how evil the intents of, of the heart of any earthly ruler might be, 2 Samuel 17 reminds us it's not so wicked that the heavenly ruler can't override and redirect to see that his purposes are carried out. What a reminder we have here that every earthly government is still under the control of the eternal king. Every government's under his control, and every one of our lives are under his control. And the peace and the rest that the Lord wants that just to bring and settle in our hearts tonight. Let's pray and let's ask him just to bring that to us. <clears throat> Father, again, we thank you for this reminder tonight. As we just see your sovereign hand at work <clears throat> in David's life. As evil was abounding, as wickedness was growing, as everything was, was against him, or it seemed like he was a sitting duck, he seemed like he was, he was done for. There was no way out. And yet, Lord, we see the truth of your word that, that, that truly the hearts of, of those who are most, we consider most powerful in this world are in your hand. And you can direct it like a river course, God. You are the sovereign Lord of our lives and Lord, we thank you for that, God. We think we can rest in that truth, Father. As we see our world, we see the direction it's going, Father. Lord, whoever you allow to, to, to be on that throne, we thank you for the reminder that you are on the heavenly throne. God, and everything is working for your purposes, Lord. And Lord, thank you that you're over our lives tonight as well in the midst of the difficulties that we find ourselves in, Lord. And maybe those who've abandoned us and left us, Lord, and, and, and Lord, we look like... And look, looks like we're all alone. God, I thank you for the reminder that you know how to bring in the right people at the right time with the right provision, Lord, to see us through, Lord. You are faithful. And so, God, where we might be harboring anger and, and hurt and bitterness over what's been taken from us or done to us, Lord, I just pray tonight that you could help us focus and realize what you have brought to us. Lord, the good, those that you brought into our lives, God, to be there for us, to strengthen us, to uphold us, Lord, to walk with us, Father. You're a good God. You're a faithful God, Lord. And we just want to leave this place thanking you and praising you and just trusting, Lord, and that you will never leave us or forsake us. So God, hide your word in our heart tonight. We want to go out of this place praising you, worshiping you. You're a great God. And we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand. You guys have a great week in the Lord.
Hey everyone, thanks so much for tuning in to our live stream. We love and appreciate every one of you. If you're in need of prayer, please call the number on your screen or visit the prayer page on our website and let us know how we can pray for you. If you're into social media, be sure and follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Also, subscribe to our YouTube channel and ring the bell to be notified when we go live or post a new video. And lastly, you can download our church app by going to calvaryknoxville.org app. Thanks again for watching and God bless. Jesus in the darkness over every enemy. And Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name.